Good morning, everyone. Wonderful to be back off, uh, off a holiday. Just had a lovely time in Northern Ireland with the family, so uh, back we are. And uh, what a front row. Well done, guys. Um, right, up, right up front. Um, so for those perhaps that haven't met me before, my name is Rob Parson. I'm a pastor here at Wallet Evangelical Church. For those visiting with us this morning, you're very welcome. Lovely to have you with us. And welcome to anyone that's watching online. Just got a couple of things to mention by way of notice as we get underway. Uh, firstly, thinking of online, just to mention that this evening we're working through some teaching with R.C. Sproul. And because they're video content from online, there's a copyright that means that we can't then live stream what we're showing. So there won't be a live stream YouTube tonight, just if people are watching to mention that. Uh, other thing to mention, uh, Steve Hawkin, one of the elders here, he's just on holiday at the moment, so let's pray he'd have a, a good time, good rest up in Aviemore, I think, with these boys. So um, let's pray for him to have a, a good time uh, away. And then two other things to mention, one particularly for younger people uh, is the Holiday Bible Club that's going to be happening this next week. So starting on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, uh, there's going to be a Holiday Bible Club called Epic Explorers your ticket to adventure. So it says, come and solve the mystery of a lifetime. Join us as we explore the life of Jesus with games, crafts, activities, and lots of fun. So I think some of you guys might be there, might you? Uh, and that would be good fun. Uh, if you're perhaps not in the age bracket that can attend it, please do pray for it. Uh, that would be wonderful. Um, so that's coming up this next week and tell others uh, that that's happening. Uh, for those that are perhaps slightly above that age bracket, we've got our Bible Ministry Weekend uh, coming up soon. So on the 2nd and 3rd of September, we've got Gareth Crosley uh, coming to speak to us here. So the 2nd being a Saturday, and that means that there will be uh, two services happening at 4 o'clock and 6.30. And Gareth will come and be speaking at those, and then he'll speak for us again on the Sunday morning and Sunday evening. So there's some more information here. You can find this at the back. Do take that away with you. So that's it by way of notices but as we gather here uh, this morning it's by grace that we have been saved as God's people. He is a gracious and loving God and he calls us together. What a wonderful truth that is. Let me read us a call to worship from Paul in Philippians 1. He says as he writes to the people in Philippi he says grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So let me listen to prayer this morning as we begin. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much that you're a gracious God. Thank you that you have made a way that we can be friends with you again, that we can have peace with you. Thank you that you talk to us through the Bible. Thank you that we can pray to you and talk to you all the time. And we do pray that as we gather together this morning, as we listen to your word, we pray that you'd help us to put aside other things, other distractions, that we might come before you and remember who you are, who we are, what you've done for us, and how glorious and majestic and worthy of all praise and worship and honour you are this morning. And we do pray for your help by your spirit as we do that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, one way of doing that is singing to God, and so we're going to sing our first song, one that reminds us that Jesus is our Lord and Saviour. So if people would stand as the music starts, and we'll sing Jesus is Lord.
take a seat there. Now, uh, children, this is a bit of a time to carry on some of the question and answers that we've been working on uh, for our children's moments, or all age moments, so it is for everyone to answer as well. So, uh, let me, I think over this side is easier for the camera, I'm getting nods uh, over there so that people can see the screen and me. So, question for you as we start, not the question, but a question as we start. Uh, When you're really excited about something, what do you tend to want to do about it? What do you do when you're really excited about something? You want to do the thing straight away, yeah. If you can't do it straight away, what other sorts of things might you do? I'll give you a clue. Would you keep really quiet about it, or would you start talking about it? Talking about it, yes. On and on and on and over and over again sometimes, yeah? And you're excited that something's coming up. Maybe a day out, or a present, or a birthday. Who here might talk a lot about their birthday if it was coming up? Yes, there's uh, adults back there. Okay, this is interesting because I was going to say that there are some adults that just, oh, they're just a little bit quiet about their birthday, aren't they? For example, there's an adult here with someone whose birthday it is today, isn't it? Does anyone know who that is? Mummy. It is mummy. But don't tell anyone. Shh. Shh. Don't tell anyone, Reggie. We'll keep that quiet. We'll keep it really quiet, okay? So don't, don't tell anyone that one. Okay, so we like to talk about things, particularly things we're excited about and happy about, but we also like to talk about things that we're sad about sometimes. If we get hurt, often you'll run to mum and dad, won't you, and you'll explain to them what happened or or why you're sad. So you'll talk about things that are in your heart. Okay, so when it comes to the Bible, we can talk a lot, not just to mums and dads and the people around us, but we can talk to God. And that's something that we call prayer. So today's question in the catechism is a very simple one. What is prayer? So, yes, John? Talking to God. Talking to God, you've got it. Excellent. So sometimes we might think prayer is just an action where you just have to put your hands together, shut your eyes and bow your head. Now, that might help us not to be distracted sometimes, But that's not all prayer is. Prayer is talking to God. So what might we say to God? That's a question, isn't it? Well, the Bible helps us with what we can say to God, and it helps us in this particular verse here in Psalm 62, verse 8. So I wonder if everyone together could help me read out this verse. Oh, thank you, Thomas. Thomas, you're going to help read out the verse? Right, if we read it all together, then we can hear what we might say to God. So... Trust in God at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Psalm 62, verse 8. Excellent. Okay, so in there you see it says, pour out your heart before him. So the Bible tells us that if you've got something to say, you can say it to God. Anything, whether we're happy, whether we're sad, whether we're worried, whether we're excited, we can pour out our hearts to God and talk to him. And that's what prayer is, pouring out our hearts in all that we do. So let's have a a recap of the question and the answer. Okay, hopefully a very simple thing. So I'll read the question and then if everyone could read the answer, that will help us to remember it. So what is prayer? Prayer is pouring out our hearts to God in praise, petition, confession of sin, and thanksgiving. Excellent. Well done, everyone. So there's lots of things in there, aren't there? Petition, confession of sin, thanksgiving. And we'll be doing one of those things, confession of sin, in just a moment. But for now, let me close us with a short prayer uh, to our Father. So let's pray. Our Father and our great refuge, we thank you that you call us to prayer. We thank you that you're not far away, you're near, and you hear us when we pray. Please let us pour out our hearts to you without ceasing. Let us pray without guile, bringing our true selves before your throne of grace. Amen. 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 Great. Well done.
uh, everyone. We're going to uh, sing again uh, now. And our next song is one that speaks of God's love and it compares it to an ocean which flows around us and all over us. So let's stand and sing again of God's love. As I mentioned, one of the things that we can do and are called to do in prayer is to confess our sin to God. And that's just reflective of the fact that as Christians, uh, as we gather together, we don't gather together to sit and point the fingers at other people and say, oh, they're not good. We gather as Christians and we admit, no, we're not good. And we need help and we need forgiveness for the things that we've done wrong. So a a humble attitude before a good God that says, I'm sorry, God, I haven't got it right this week, this hour, this month, this year, and saying we're sorry for that. But not just saying sorry, but also hearing the fact that he forgives us and he loves us and he's paid that price for us. So he sees us as washed clean, which is an amazing truth. So uh, one way we're going to do that and can do that is we're going to uh, say the words of a confession. It's based on Psalm 51 where David was asking for forgiveness. So Susan, if I could get a slide up on the screen, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. That's all right. Um, This will hopefully help us just have words based on Psalm 51 uh, to confess. There we go. Thank you. So uh, let's pray uh, together. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, having confessed our sins, listen to this reminder in Revelation 1 where John speaks of how we're forgiven. He says, Jesus Christ is the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. He loves us and he has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. It's a wonderful message of grace and salvation for the Christian. And we're going to sing again now. And towards the end of this song, children, that will be time to head up to Sunday school. But our next song is one that speaks of the character of God in all his faithfulness. So uh, let's stand and sing again together.
we're going to take this uh, time now to just bring some petitions and praise and adoration to our Father in prayer. So let me lead us as we pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time this morning. Thank you for this place that we can meet and gather. And we do thank you for who you are. We thank you that you're a faithful God, that your faithfulness is great, that it is unchanging, that it is unending. We thank you so much that you are faithful and keep your promises. You're trustworthy, and so when you say that it will happen, it will happen. We thank you that we can rely on that and depend on that in a way that we can't do that with other people around us. And we just praise you and thank you that there is security and safety and hope and help to be had there in your faithfulness. So we do thank you that you're a faithful God with steadfast love, that you've shown that throughout the Old Testament, throughout the New Testament, throughout church history, throughout our very lives (laughs) ourselves. And we just praise you and thank you for that. This morning, Father, we pray knowing that there are many and various camps going on at this time of year. We thank you for the different organisations running some of those different camps. We thank you for the CPS Ventures and Falcons. Thank you for Christians in Sport camps. Thank you for Contagious uh, running camps uh, all over the country. And we thank you for uh, the ones that Westcott camp uh, and the sister camp to that for the boys. We do thank you for all of those camps that are happening. And we thank you for the leaders that have facilitated and made them possible. We thank you for all of the young people that you've brought (coughs) on those camps and we thank you for the chance that they have to hear something of the gospel. We pray that those young people might find uh, a place where they can uh, rest, where they can have fun, where they can enter into thoughts, discussions, ask questions that they've got, but they can also see the gospel lived out in the lives of the leaders. We do pray for the talks as they happen that the children would be able to focus and listen and gain something of them and that for those that are already believing, they might be really strengthened in their time there. For those that have never heard it before, that they might understand something new and that they might want to bow the knee as well. We do pray for safety, knowing that there's lots of fun activities that happen on those camps. But we pray for safety for the leaders and for the young people. We pray that you'd uh, keep them as uh, safe as can be. Uh, for where that isn't always the case and isn't possible, and we do live in a broken world, we pray that you would help the camps to be able to deal with those situations well to be really helpful to parents, to be able to be honest and transparent and open wherever necessary. So we do just pray for those camps and praise you that they've been able to happen over the years and for the fruit that has come from them. Finally, Father, we also pray this morning for other churches in our region, in our area. This morning particularly, we think of Eyemouth Baptist Church with Stephen and Marcy Bender up there. Been there 20 years or so, faithfully proclaiming your words to many people in my eye mouth. We thank you so much for that gospel witness happening there week in, week out, as that'll be happening this morning. We do pray for Stephen, that you would sustain him, that you'd help him to proclaim your gospel clearly, to teach sound doctrine in season and out of season, to reprove, to rebuke, to correct, and to train in righteousness. We do pray for them, that you'd keep them in good heart and in good spirit. Pray for their children, Kenneth and Amy, that you would keep them uh, as well in their respective jobs and lives. And we do pray for the people of the borders, and particularly those in that region around Eyemouth, that they might be able to hear the gospel. They might be able to come in, to bend the knee, and to join your kingdom. So we do pray for for Eyemouth Baptist Church this morning in particular. And we bring all of these uh, prayers and petitions, knowing that there are uh, many other things to pray for as well, particularly the health Uh, and sustaining power for those in this flock, this congregation, that you might uphold all of those who are hurting and suffering today, uh, that you might help them in this time and in the pain that they're in. We bring them all before you, knowing that you love to hear as we talk to you. And we pray them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to turn to the Bible, to God's words now. We're going to be continuing on in our sermon series, working through the Gospel of John. And we're now up to chapter 15, verses 18 to 27. So I've asked Susan Wilson if she'll come up and read that for us. Now, if you've got the Black ESV Church Bibles, that's on page 902. So if Susan, you'd come up and read that, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. If 
the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But on all these, they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me, my father, whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the words that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper comes, whom I send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me, and you will also bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. Thank you, uh, Susan, for reading that to us. Do keep that open in front of you if you've uh, got that. Uh, let me just lead us in a prayer as we start asking for God to help us work through this. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this passage. Thank you for what we learn of Jesus in it. We do pray that you'd help us now as we look to understand more, to grow more, that you'd help us to do that. But by your spirit, you might open our eyes and help it to change us. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, love is a topic, isn't it, that we love to think about, to talk about, to discuss. It's a, it's a lovely topic uh, to think on, but hate is a harder topic. Definitely a harder topic. And yet, this is the transition that we're seeing Jesus make in this passage. So he's been talking, particularly with reference to the true vine in the start of chapter 15, about the love of God and being in the love of God and remaining in that love. And there's lots of love content in there. And he's now transitioned. And in the start of the passage, you'll see he introduces the word hate. So if the world hated you. So we get this introduction of hate, the hatred of the world. Yet, if I was to ask everyone here this morning and say, who here hates Christians? I'm imagining most people would be like, well, no, not me. <laughs> and who out there hates Christians? Well, no one really necessarily comes to mind of sort of uh, friends around. I mean, after all, perhaps we might think Christians, they're lovely, aren't they? Lovable individuals <laughs> and hopefully loving. Well, yes and no. <laughs> That's the reality, isn't it, with, with Christian people? Yes and, yes and no on that front. Christians are certainly loved. That has been very, hopefully, very clearly stated by Jesus in this passage. We can read all about that. Say, for example, in verse 9 of chapter 15, Jesus says, As the Father's loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love, remain in my love. And then he goes on to say in verse 17, these things I command you so that you will love one another. So that's very much there. Yes, Christians are loved and are supposed to be loving, loved by God, loving God, loving one another. And yet there is the painful reality and history as we look backwards that there isn't just love for Christians by God. That is certain, that's sure, but there is hatred of Christians, amongst others, admittedly, but by the world. So the world has and does often hate Christians. Let's take a whistle-stop history tour. I'm sure lots of this will be familiar, but if you were to take the early Roman Empire, Christians were certainly not a popular group amongst them. They were hated, harassed, 
they were persecuted, they were accused of all sorts of things, incest, treason, illegal assembly, cannibalism. These were all the sorts of things that were on the charge sheet for Christians back then. Particularly that began in the first century AD. It went on well into the fourth century AD. You might have heard of Roman emperors such as Nero, Marcus Aurelius, Dacius, Gallus, Diocletian. Under all of them, there is lots of evidence of much hatred, really, of Christians and persecutions of them. It didn't stop there. You could find many other examples. But if we were to jump to the 20th century and we went to the Soviet Union, you'd find that from 1917 to 1991, it's been estimated, and these are only rough estimates, but perhaps 12 million or so Christians have been persecuted by the Soviet Union during that time. And not just as individuals for doing individual things wrong, but for wearing the label or the identity of being Christians, so having an allegiance to the Christian religion. Their churches were destroyed, people were harassed, they were persecuted, executed. But it didn't just stop in 1991, did it? If you were to go onto the Open Doors website, they've got loads of information, and on there they tell us that currently in North Korea, it's at a record high level of persecution, with arrests, closures of churches, and apparently they're either just brought in or thinking of bringing in a new anti-reactionary thought law, which is going to cover Christians as being anti-reactionary. Globally, last year, apparently, this is just last year, 5,621 people were killed for their faith, 90% of whom were in Nigeria. Lots of uh, persecution, uh, hatred there. And apparently at the moment, 360 million Christians currently face high levels of persecution for their faith today. It's hard to get our heads around numbers like that, particularly given the, the time and the place that we enjoy here. And there's lots to give thanks for for that, don't hear me wrong, lots to give thanks for in that way. But I hope, and my point is, just to say that there is and always has been a very real presence of the hatred of Christians. Amongst others, yes, I know there are other people groups hated as well, but there is evidence of hatred of Christians around in the world. And, as I said, whilst we're hopefully humbled and grateful not to be experiencing some of the ways in which that hatred has shown itself, there is evidence of it as we look around in culture, in newspapers, in reactions to Christian beliefs and practices and thoughts and so on. You can find it. The Christian Institute and uh, organisations like that do a great job of highlighting some of these situations. So it's there. I'm not saying it's everyone, I'm not saying it's all the time, not at all, but I hope what I'm saying is we would agree, yes, okay, we can observe that there is hatred of Christians around in the world and today. But why? Why is there hatred? That's the question, isn't it? It's not just it exists, but why? That's our question, and it's our question, hopefully, because it's one of Jesus' um, questions that he's posing and he's answering for the disciples, for his followers who are there. And just to give a bit of a, a context reminder, here we are in John's Gospel, and Jesus is in the process of teaching a goodbye lecture, as it were, or a goodbye sermon to his followers. And he's about halfway through, and the first half really focused on, you are loved this is your identity, this is your relationship with God. You need to get that, you need to hold on to that, you need to know that, you need to trust that. Then we hit this halfway point at about verse 18, and now for the second half of it, he's slightly more transitioning to focus on, okay, so if that's who you are, if that's your identity, how are you going to be received? How is the world going to relate to you given your identity? So we're in kind of part two, as it were, of this farewell discourse as some people call it so in that way it prepares them it prepares the disciples to know what's coming down the track so that they're not surprised so that they can keep going so that they can trust him when things get rocky when things get rough and they can keep going following him how does he do it well he does it 
by pointing out the source of this hatred. Then he builds something of a case against those who are doing the hating. And then finally, he explains the help that is on offer. So we're going to work through the source, the case against those who are hating, and then the help that is on offer. I do have a few little headings to um, go as we go uh, along, and I've titled the sermon, Follow the Leader. Hopefully that will become clear as we go through, because the point is the disciples, the followers, are to keep following Jesus, even though this hatred's going to be there. So, firstly, let's just try and unpack a little bit more of the source of this hatred then. And to begin with, Jesus kind of just highlights its existence before unpacking more of the the reason why. He's telling them that it's going to exist, and he doesn't sugarcoat it. In verse 18, he says, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it's hated you. Jesus is saying, look, this is going to be a reality of your Christian life. Don't be surprised. (coughs) It might be that as you read the first word there, if, you kind of think, oh, maybe it won't happen. That's not the way to read it. The way to read it is, if it's going to happen, the implied answer is, which it will. So it's not an if, it's a when you're hated, rather than just, it may or may not happen. And a reminder there that when it says, the world... It's not just referring to the grass, the bushes, the tectonic plates of this earth. That's not what John is using the word world to refer to. He's meaning the people on earth, the peoples of earth that don't know God, that don't trust God, that don't want to listen and follow God. Those that are against God. And in John's gospel, there's a bit of description there of those that are in the dark compared to those that are in the light. So that's what he means by the world. So when it comes to being hated, right from the start, Jesus is saying, I'm with you. He's not saying that he's in splendid isolation in the top floor of a penthouse, ordering his underlings, his followers, to go out and face the hatred of the world on their own. No, he's saying he's the one at the front of the queue for being hated. He's the leader that everyone else is going to follow. And therefore what happens to him will happen to his followers. And that following him is going to involve hard times. Perhaps think of the bow of a ship. As that takes the full force of the waves as they break on the bow, the rest of the ship then follows on behind. He's the head. He's the leader. He's the lightning rod, as it were, on whom and because of whom the antipathy, the hatred, the aggression of the world is going to fall and focus on him. So why does the world hate Jesus and his followers? Well, simply, we could think of it as because he is different. Because of difference. There's a hatred because of difference. And because he is different, his followers are different. You see that in verse 19. He tells his disciples, he says, look, if you were the same as the world, if you were of the world, if you were exactly the same, then they'd love you. But because you've been chosen out of it, because you've been marked out as different, you're different and the world doesn't like that. He's saying to them that, yes, you're living in the world, but you're no longer from the world. Saying you stand out, you're distinctive, you're different to the world. So in what way are Christians supposed to be recognisably different then? Well, they're supposed to be different because they're the ones that have been chosen by Jesus in verse 19. That means that they have then been given new spiritual life. They've been saved. They've been born again from above. That's the way John describes it, isn't it? Which means that they're no longer children of the world. They're children of God. Which means that Christians aren't to just be a little bit different to the world, not just slightly more morally upstanding, they're actually supposed to be fundamentally different because Christians have a new spiritual life within them that transforms them, that gives them new spiritual sight. Christians have a whole different way of looking at the world to those that aren't Christians. A new relationship with the creator. So a new existence in some ways, a restored relationship with the creator that made us. That's very different to a broken one, and so different in that way. Not an enemy of God, not at war with our maker, 
but friends with him and therefore living out his way, his commands, his morals, his existence. There's plenty of uh, times in the Bible where Christians are described as aliens or foreigners in this world because this world is not the home of Christians. It's a house, it's, it's a staging post on the way to our eternal home and therefore Christians are marked out as different people. But if we're using this language of foreign, then I think the world of biology gives us a bit of a helpful analogy. So how is a foreign object treated within the body? It's not treated well, is it? One writer I was uh, reading talking about this, uh, he says, what happens if a a foreign uh, body, uh, a disease, virus, bacteria, whatever it is, gets into the bloodstream? Well, the body's reaction is to send antibodies towards it, to try and overwhelm it, to destroy it. That's the um, response, the reaction to a a foreign uh, entity in the bloodstream. And the thing is, that is kind of what happens with the Christian in the world. There's a difference. There's a foreignness to the Christian in the world. And the world reacts by trying to overwhelm and close down that different thing. So that's the Christian life of the follower of Jesus. This is why the hatred is there, because of the difference. That's where the source lies. And the question is, is that what we signed up for as Christians? Did we sign up to be different? Did we sign up to be hated? Well, probably wasn't first and foremost on the list, was it? But Jesus is here explaining to his disciples, this is what a follower of Jesus can expect. Like the leader, like the team. He says that in verse 20, doesn't he? He said, he's the master and he's been persecuted and hated. Therefore, it follows that the servant of the master, who isn't greater than the master, is going to suffer the same hatred that the master suffers as well. But as we're talking about this, and we're thinking about people who don't like who hate the Christians, who, who hate Jesus, then we might be sat here thinking, well, then how are they going to get away with this? In God's world, why does God just sit there and let this happen? What does God think about this? Is he, is he just desperate that this didn't happen, but it's going against him and he can't do anything? Well, that's where Jesus moves on and says, no, there is a case to be made against those who hate Christians. So that's our second uh, point this morning. We're looking at verses 22 to 25, the case against those uh, that hate. So in verse 22, Jesus says that as he came into the world, it was his presence that pointed out sin in the world. He doesn't mean that before he came, everything was absolutely fine, innocent and perfect, but then he arrived and suddenly it got bad. No, he's not saying that. He's saying that like a torch in a pitch dark cellar, when he came into the world, he was the one that exposed the the sin that was already lurking there in those corners. You see, with Jesus coming into the world in verse 22, sin was exposed for everyone to see. And as the light, he not only exposes it, but he also judges it as it comes to light. If it's evil, it means it's going to be punished. If it's good, it means it will be commended. He's the judge. And he's the judge that knows absolutely everything. Why? Well, because he's one with the Father. He's God, and he's come in to expose this sin. So there is a case to be made against those that hate Christians. And so uh, it follows in verse 23 that perhaps if we imagine the defiant defendant that walks into the courtroom like many an accused criminal has done over the years. Perhaps they walk into the courtroom, they stand in the dock, but they boldly look the judge in the eye and say, I don't recognise your authority over me whatsoever. I don't recognise the authority of this court. Well, nine times out of ten, 99 times out of 100 in our current justice system, that doesn't play particularly well. It doesn't mean that they're therefore not going to be found guilty just because they don't accept the authority of the court. Actually, what it ends up doing is showing a contempt for the court, a contempt for the judge and a contempt for the nation that has elected the judge to be there to do the judging. It goes up the chain 
as it were, when you reject the words of the judge. And that's why in verse 23, Jesus is explaining this case against them. Whoever hates me is actually hating my father. It goes up the chain. It goes back up to God, the father. So why are they hating God in this way? Well, because God's representative has come into the world. Jesus has come in as the light, like the torch, shining into the darkness, as the representative of God. He's shown them all these things in verse 24, signs, miracles, wonders, and in doing them, he's exposed just how lost, how blind, how proud, and how in need of total salvation this world is. And that's what people don't like. That's what the darkness doesn't like. The world, or those in the dark, are pretty happy telling God to just leave them alone. Just let me get on with doing my own thing. A little bit like me when I'm told that I'm doing something wrong. And my instinct is to say, no, no, I'm not. I'm not. Just leave, leave me alone. Leave me alone. Get on, let me get on with it. Don't tell me I'm wrong. Well, that's what the world says to Jesus. It says, just, just go away. Leave me be. Let me live my life how I want to live my life. I don't appreciate the fact that you're trying to point out the sin in my life. And then it gets stronger than that, doesn't it? I hate the fact that you're pointing out the sin in my life. And the fact that it's you pointing it out in my life means that I end up hating you. And because hating Jesus, who's pointing out the sin, we're being told that that means hating God, the Father, as well. Remember the context they're living in here, surrounded by interacting with the Jewish authorities. This wouldn't have been easy listening for them, to being told that if they're not submitting and listening to Jesus... Therefore, they are hating God. That would have been strong for them to hear that, this chain of logic that goes back up to God. But the case follows, doesn't it, that because Jesus is hated, God is being hated. But it might be at that point, if we hear God's being hated, that we might be tempted to think, oh, I feel a bit bad for God. He's being hated by people instead of loved by people. Perhaps he's tried his best, but the people just aren't really very interested. Well, let's just uh, be reassured that this was no surprise to God. Verse 25 tells us that God knew this was going to happen. He knew this was going to happen to his son, Jesus, whom he loves, long before it really happened. This was all known to God. God knew that because of sin... Which, how do we define that? Well, sin is an attitude that says to God, no, I'm okay, leave me alone. Go away, get out of my life, I want to do things my way. A rebellion against God. But God knew that because of that, when he sent Jesus, he would be hated. Even though Jesus only ever did the right thing. I think that's important to remember, isn't it? That there were no grounds, there was no cause to actually hate Jesus. He didn't do anything that gave genuine and real reason to hate him. We see that in the quote in verse 25 that John writes down, they hated me without a cause. He's picking that up from a poem written hundreds of years before in the Psalms, that's Psalms 35 and 69, that speak of the way in which a righteous man was unfairly hated. It was just a picture back in those psalms, but once we get to Jesus, it's fulfilled. Jesus truly is the only man that could ever be genuinely said of him. He hadn't done anything to cause the hatred. In a way that, as Christians, we all make mistakes, and sometimes there are occasions when we've got things wrong, and people are understandably not happy with us. Sometimes we do that. That wasn't the case with Jesus. There was no cause for people to hate him. But the prophecy's been fulfilled. Jesus, God knew that that was going to happen. The prophecy's fulfilled. And in fulfilling the prophecy, that's where I'd say the case is open and shut against those that are hating Jesus and hating his followers. The world hated Jesus because he exposed their sin. He brought it out into the light. The world hated that representative of God that did that, and therefore the world hated God. Which means that then as we see the leader and the team, hopefully it makes sense that as the world hates the leader, the team that follow that leader are hated as well. Because the followers are trying to follow what the leader has set as the pattern. It's no surprise that if the world hates a perfect morally beautiful, righteous, patient, kind, wise and good man, 
well then how much more will they hate his followers? All of us of whom are pretty smudged impressions uh, of Jesus right now. So yes, it follows that the followers of Jesus will be hated just for wearing the name badge Christian. Just for wearing that name badge. Now it's not got there yet in this country, but if one was to visit China or, or North Korea or certain places and you walked in with a big name badge saying, I'm a believer in Jesus, I'm a Christian, there won't be a warm reception. There will not be a warm reception. Not because they've worked out who you are and how you operate and how you've been unkind at certain it would be because of the name badge. Because of the name badge. Not in all cases, not all the times, but the point is there. The followers will be hated. Which brings us to our final point. Because it might be, and it is for me as I'm reading through this, that we reach a point where we just think, do you know what? Help. Help. This doesn't sound good. This doesn't sound nice. I don't like conflict, I don't like tension, I don't like awkward moments in conversations, and I certainly don't like it when people don't like me. I I like to be liked, and I don't like to be unliked. There's a reason why on social media there isn't isn't an unlike button, is there? There's just a like uh, button. Perhaps you'll agree with me then that we don't want to be hated, or to hate. That isn't what we want. It's not nice. It's not the way that we want to live. We want to love and be loved. And yet here, Jesus is talking to his followers and he's telling them that, yes, Jesus loves you, but the world hated Jesus, and so you'll be hated as well, likewise. Which hopefully does leave us at a point where we're saying, wow, I need help in this. I'm going to need help going forwards in the Christian life. Well, God is good. God is very good. And because he's more than aware that we are weak, And he is strong. That's where in verses 26 and 27 of this passage, which kind of caps it off, he says, look, I'm going to give you the help. And not just any old help, not just a bit of a pep talk on those tough days, but I'm going to give you the helper, the Holy Spirit himself in us. That's the help he's going to provide. He says the Holy Spirit will come from the Father. He'll live in you. He'll remind you. He'll encourage you. He'll equip you. He'll give you courage to endure the hatred that is going to be there as he will bear witness to us about Jesus, about God, about his word. But the interesting thing that struck me looking at those verses in 26 and 27 is that the help isn't just there to help us weather the storm by battening down the hatches and keeping us kind of ring-fenced and secure in that way. The help is there in verse 27 that we might go forwards and bear witness so he'll protect us he'll help us but in order that we go forwards that we go out in the face of hostility and hatred and bear witness about him you see the disciples have been with him since he started his ministry he tells us that here they were there with him from the beginning and they were on the team that was designated to take out the word to the world once jesus had returned to be with the father but jesus is telling them there's going to be hate on the way but there's also help in the witness that you're called to take out and that brings us uh, towards a close of this passage but as we do kind of bring things together it is worth remembering isn't it that all of those case studies or those examples from history uh, that i mentioned in so many of them and in the fiercest times of those hatred the early days of the roman empire and other examples as well what happened to the faith of the gospel was it snuffed out not at all so often it thrived in those environments millions of christians in china as we speak nigeria millions of christians there as well and yet some of the greatest hatred as well so that hatred has not stopped this witness at all and there's encouragement to be had there as we look backwards at case studies and examples the witness from then was about to spread out from jerusalem judea samaria to the ends of the earth. So just a couple of things that I thought I'd leave us with, just hopefully by way of sort of applicatory reminders to stick in our minds. So firstly, I think Jesus is telling his followers to expect that there will be negativity, that there will be hatred of Christianity as Christianity follows Jesus. So he's saying, expect it. It's a simple point. Don't be surprised by the hate. Jesus was 
hated. And so if we want to follow him as one who was hated, then we can expect to walk into the uh, same storm of hate that was around him. But don't worry, he has gone first. He's the bow of the ship. He's endured that hate uh, to start with. So when we read history, when we turn on the news, we uh, read in the Christian Institute or wherever it is, we need to remember that we're not greater than our master. We're servants of him, and so we can <coughs> expect it. That said, there is worth just putting a caveat in here, isn't there? We don't need to go looking for it. That's not what I'm saying. It's not as if it's a badge of godliness. How much can I appear to be hated or to try and make it work as if our objective is to be hated? No, it's not that. That would be somewhat foolish, I'd suggest. Rather, we can just expect that it will be there as we proclaim the truth that comes into conflict with the worldview of the world. So we can expect it, we can endure it, and actually we can rejoice that we're counted worthy to be on that team that follows Jesus. That's an amazing privilege to be there on that team. So firstly, expect it. Expect it simply. Secondly, remember the leader. In verse 20, there is one of the few specific commands in this passage, uh, a few imperatives um, that he gives there, an imperative. And what's the word in verse 20? Remember. Remember the word. Remember the leader, he tells us. He says, remember the words that he's spoken to us. Where do we find them? We find them in the Bible. He's spoken to us. And he says in verse 20 uh, that the word will do one of two things. Either... It will be heard and hated, and there will be persecution, or it will be heard and responded to rightly, and there will be obedience. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours as well. So remember the leader that he proclaimed the word, and as he proclaimed that, it can be responded to, yes, with hatred, but also with hope, with acceptance, with belief, with a rejoicing willingness to follow the leader. That's what we hope that his world will do for those that don't know it yet. <coughs> and it is true, isn't it, that to reject such a gift of extravagant grace and beauty, to reject that kind of a gift that he's given us, is to reject the giver of the gift. That logic makes sense. We've seen that uh, today. So that might be uh, a word of a warning to any that are, are listening, uh, that if we decide, actually, I don't want anything to do with Christianity, we are rejecting not just Jesus, but also God, the creator of the whole world. But those that have accepted that word, that want to keep that word, then let's not be surprised by it, let's expect it. But let's also keep remembering our leader, keep remembering Jesus as the leader that endured all of these things, that we might follow him and that we're not on our own there's help help who verses 26 and 27 the holy spirit he's the help that we have and that's where jesus will go on to talk more about next week as we follow on speak more about the ministry the work of the holy spirit in us and in the world let me lead us in a prayer then as we finish Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you're so honest with us in this world. Thank you that you tell it to us as it is. Thank you that you describe to us what life will be like. Thank you that you describe that to the disciples here and then. And we do thank you so much that we can see that that has played itself out in history. But we can also rely on you as a good God who sustains, who guides, who helps, who keeps us going. And we do pray for that help as we follow we pray for those perhaps around the world today that are hated in a violent manner. Perhaps we think of those in, in Pakistan just in the last few days having churches burnt and attacked. We do pray for those that are facing very strong and physical violence for this. We pray that you would sustain them in the midst of it. Please help them. And we do pray that you would help us this morning as well to endure, to expect and to rejoice to be able to follow the leader. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, our final uh, song that we're going to sing to close out our time uh, this morning uh, is one that speaks of the cross of Christ and how he is the one that saved us and that's how we can be on his team. So let's stand and sing together.
refreshments served afterwards, but as we finish, let me just read some words of encouragement from Paul as we leave here. As Paul said in Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen.